Good evening, and uh, again, uh, it's just a pleasure to be here with you. Uh, Pastor Bill Monday, if I have not met with you, and like Pastor Michael invited you after the service, if uh, you have thoughts, uh, would like to talk, I'd love to meet you and get to know you. Uh, We have five pastors between the two campuses, St. Peter up North Appleton, just right on the border there, Freedom, if you don't know. I am pastor of our family ministries between the two campuses, and I work with the school up there at the St. Peter campus too. Uh, So we are all here to encourage you however we can, and I especially uh, love to encourage families uh, by bringing you God's Word. And so that brings me to our message here. Uh, Again, as Pastor Michael said, really a focus on the grow root. Uh, That would be defined, and we'll define it a little bit later, just digging deep into God's Word as a family, in our our own families, personally with our, our spouses and so on, so that we might be blessed with the Spirit's fruits. So that's our theme for tonight, uh, greater growth, greater growing in the Lord. Our meditation will be on Psalm chapter 1, verses 1 through 3, and I'd like to kick off with a a little bit of a story. Two friends were gathered together at a coffee shop. They hadn't seen each other in a while, and they wanted to catch up on life. Uh, One of the friends was somewhat of a church history buff, so he knew a little bit about uh, church history in the Bible, and he was kind of a, a Bible collector at that as well. The other friend had stumbled into an inheritance. Uh, His father passed away and he received all his dad's property. His dad had gifted him, among many things, an old Bible. So that's what they were talking about. Uh, One friend said to the other, so my dad gifted me with this cool Bible, this old Bible, but I got so much stuff as I was giving it all away and putting it all away and trying to clean up through it that I, I ended up getting rid of that that Bible, which I'm I'm kicking myself, he said, I would have loved to share that with you just to see if you had any interest in it. So guy said, well, uh, hey, just tell me a little bit about it. You said it's old. I mean, how old do you think it was? And I mean, what language was it written in? He said, well, you know what? I I think it might have been like hundreds of years old. Um, And it was written in German. Uh, It was printed by some guy named Guten something. And uh, his friend said, you mean like, like Gutenberg? Like Gutenberg Press, as in like the guy who invented the printing press. You mean you had one of those Bibles, maybe? They're like, there's only 50 of them in the world, and oh, they uh, have a value of $25 million or more? Tell me you didn't get rid of a Gutenberg Bible. And the guy cringed. He said, yeah, I think I might have gotten rid of a Gutenberg Bible. But, but you know, it was hardly in mint condition, he continued, trying to soothe his uh, conscience that was bothered. It had all the scribbling all over it from a, a guy by the name of Martin something. <laughs> you mean Martin Luther? He said, yeah, that was the guy. Why, do you know him? <laughs> oh, what a terrible, terrible conversation, right? Of course, that's just a little joke among Bible nerds and Bible collectors. Of course, something like that could never happen, right? It'd be absolutely absurd, somebody getting rid of a Gutenberg Bible with Martin Luther's scribblings all over it. It would have infinite value, millions and millions of dollars. Which kind of leads us to our topic tonight and a question I wanted to pose to you. Really, our opening question, if we take a look at our sheets, how much is your Bible worth to you? Yeah, your English Bible, I know it's not going to compare to a Gutenberg Bible that's hundreds of years old. But still, how much is your personal Bible worth to you? And I'm not talking about monetary value. I mean, English Bibles are a dime a dozen. In fact, you can go online, you can get dozens of translations, versions of the English Bible for free. You can download it in your YouVersion app. In fact, you can download the audio. People will read to you an English Bible for free. So as far as monetary value, I suppose, if you really needed a Bible, we can get you one for free. You can go to any hotel, by the way, take a Gideon Bible. They actually want you to take their Bibles from the hotel rooms. They would love nothing more. But I mean to you, what is your Bible worth? And I know this. We Christian people, we love, we love the Bible. We know it is God's word. And, and I, I guarantee if I went down and I talked to every one of you individually and I asked, what's your Bible mean to you? How much is it worth to you? I guarantee you would tell me it's, it's priceless. It's priceless. And you tell me Why? You would say, because I know with the scriptures, and I can rest at night, especially when I have no reason to rest. And you tell me that 
the scriptures can heal all wounds, can reconcile all relationships. That's how powerful the blood of Christ is, which the Bible proclaims. You tell me about how much joy and love and patience and kindness and gentleness and self-control and faithfulness all comes out of the scriptures so that you might have abundant life. I know you tell me that, and then you tell me that it gives you heaven. And all by grace, all because of Jesus, all because of that fountain of blood that we just sang about and we embrace. You tell me it's of infinite value. Yes, your Bible. And I tell you the same. And we'd praise God. But then there's another question to follow up with. And it's more of a challenging question for us tonight. Do our actions back up our beliefs? We all know, hands down, the Bible is everything. It's priceless. It gives us eternity and life right now. But if that's the case, are you like me? And do you look at your life and you wonder, well, then why am I not in my scripture more? Why don't I soak it up from day to day and every moment and think about what it is that God spoke to me, paid for by the infinite value, worth of blood of Jesus Christ? That's a challenging question, isn't it? Why don't our actions back up that belief, that beautiful belief? So I recognize the challenge before us in this message isn't so much trying to convince us that the Bible is of infinite worth and gives us life. We know that. But it's the answer to the disconnect. Why aren't our actions more in line with what we believe? Again, why aren't we in it every day? Or I suppose I could ask that question one other way that fits really well with our Mission and Vision series with the third root that we look to sink down, the grow root. I could ask, how is your grow root? How's your grow root doing? And if you're new to the whole concept of the roots and uh, this third G, the grow root, I could define it for you just right up here. It is that root which we look to sink down into Christ through personal and for couple and family devotional time at home and throughout our daily lives, both in formal and informal, teachable moments, speaking the word of God. That's what we mean with the grow root. How is your grow root? How's mine? I want to convince you if you feel like it's not as good as you would hope. It's not as deep as you would like. It's not growing as well. Maybe even, maybe even it's starting to shrivel up. I'd like to share with you the whys behind the G. Why God would invite us to sink that deep root down into Christ. And it's all about the fruit that comes out of it. You see, God wants us to be in the word, his word every day, not because it's a burden, not because he wants to just pile one more thing on your schedule, but so that you might rest in your schedule, so that you might feel truly blessed and happy. And so I'm going to give you some of the whys, if you would permit, just from what I've experienced in my life. And what you're going to see on your sheet and up on the board is a bunch of blanks, and I'm going to help you fill those out from my own personal experience, my testimony, if you will, about how critical this root is to celebrate being in God's word every day around the kitchen table and in life, the word of God with family, moms and dads, brothers and sisters, and the home. I think back to first grade. When I was in first grade, you know, I was like any typical kid. Just had my mind on video games and playing G.I. Joes or whatever else. At this time, though, in my family's life, my parents, they were coming to know Jesus really for the first time. I apologize if you already know my family's background, but if you don't, I think this is critical to why personal devotions, formal and informal, are so critical. My family and I, when I was in first grade, and my parents were in the late 30s, came out of the Mormon church. And the Mormon church, as sincere, and I still have family members in the Mormon church, as sincere as it may be, it doesn't proclaim the Christ of the scriptures. It does not proclaim a Jesus who saves by grace. My parents, they didn't know Jesus then. And they were invited to a sister congregation in Cincinnati, Ohio, where they came to understand through a class like Pastor Michael offers in starting point, what grace really means. 
and they came to know the Lord. And they knew now this beautiful salvation that many of us have known from our baptisms early on, which I came to know when I was about six or seven. They finally came to know Jesus and that he did it all. Everything that they needed, he did. His righteousness, his blood, his resurrection. And they were on fire. I mean, they were the epitome of the story that Jesus told about salvation. They were the man that came across a field with a treasure in it, then went away and sold everything they had so they could buy that field and have that treasure. To this day, when I talk to my parents, that's what we talk about. It's God's grace, which saved us. And so I remember one time, just over the kitchen table, my mom, she was talking about Jesus, and and that's what she did, and that's what my dad did, and they would read the Bible every day, and I thought this is what families did. I just thought, hey, we always talk about Jesus, right? That's what we do. I remember my mom speaking about how she was so thankful for grace, how she confessed that if she had died before coming to know Christ at, at our church, she would have been condemned forever. And rightfully so for her sins, but now she knows grace. And and she said that if she were to die that day, she would be with the Lord, her heavenly father, all because of Jesus. She was so excited about grace. And again, to this day, still as excited. And I remember saying something that was pretty stupid. (laughs) And I was a first grader. I'd like to say it was because I was so young, but it was because of my sinful nature, which I still have. But as a first grader, after hearing this beautiful confession of faith and grace, I remember telling my mom, like, well, I know that Jesus is wonderful and that he loves us and that he died to forgive us. But mom, I'm still a pretty good boy. I was still a pretty good boy. I think I would have been okay. Oh, my mom looked at me and I could tell I said something really stupid. I knew as soon as I said it, it wasn't right. But my mom in love and my dad was there. They encouraged me. And impressed upon me grace. My mom said, no, Bill. It is always and only about God's grace. It's from a grow root like that, just everyday conversations, that grace was truly impressed upon me. Not just from the gather root, because I had heard grace time and time again at church. Not just from the group root and Sunday school and Bible studies as we do life together. But in everyday conversations, studying the word on our own and among our families. Again, grace. And I remember that. To this day, I still can picture the scene. And that just speaks to the power of this root. Fast forward about seven years when I was in eighth grade. And again, thank you for letting me just share my story. But here I am in in our circle, seventh and eighth grade. That's where we like to uh, put our our children through a rigorous uh, course of instruction for confirmation class. We review a summary of Christian doctrine, Luther's small catechism. We, We study the scriptures. We memorize passages. So keep seventh and eighth graders here tonight uh, in your prayers. They've got a lot of work, a lot of memorizing to do, just like I did, just like many of us did. Well, there I was a few weeks away from being confirmed, and I had just studied Christian doctrine for two years, right? You'd think I would have been on fire for the Lord and that my life would have looked like that. But at that same time, I'm ashamed to admit I was running with the wrong crowd at school and I was doing a lot of things that I'm still ashamed of to this day. And it was interesting as I looked forward to confirmation and was about ready to make the greatest vow in my life that I would follow Jesus till death for that crown of life. I recognized there was a battle going on in my heart between my sinful nature and the new self that was born in baptism. And my sinful nature was winning. And I knew only one could win. And there I was at a Christian rock concert uh, with my family, my, that's what my family did. We listened to Christian music and we talked about the word of God. So my mom and dad take me to this Christian rock concert. And I remember in the middle of the concert, just thinking, looking up into the heavens, God, are you even there? Is any of this even true? And the Christian performer was Carmen. I don't know if any of you remember the 80s and 90s, like contemporary Christian music. Maybe it wasn't the best kind of music at that day. At least, Carmen, I loved him to death. I loved it. You got to go home tonight and on YouTube, uh, look up The Champion or look up uh, The Witch's Invitation or Sunday's Coming or whatever. It's cringeworthy. You'll cringe a little bit if you watch it. But I love the lyrics. I loved what he communicated. 
And that music started making an impact on my heart. And again, that's what my parents, my family, that's what we listened to all the time. And with their conversations, they didn't know what I was going through, but they knew what I needed. And that was faith. The certainty of faith. And that all came out of the grow root. And my faith grew. And when I got to that day of confirmation, that vow was made with a sincere heart of faith. It was one of my darkest moments in life, in my faith life. But God brought me through that and all through music and all through my family's witness, as well as the gather route for worship, as well as going to Sunday school and Bible study. But the grow route was vitally important. I don't know where I'd be without those everyday conversations. Fast forward another seven years, and I kid you not, it's like seven years. All these different epiphanies come around for being in God's word, and I, I wish I'd been in the word more. Uh, I don't know if that's just the biblical number. That's how God works. I'm guessing you guys look pretty smart, pretty bright. You'll probably catch on a lot faster than I did, and you'll experience these fruits more and more uh, quickly within weeks, months, if you're in the Word. But through my wife in college, I truly began to understand agape love. Agape. Agape is the biblical word for true love. It transcends the emotional feelings we have about love. And it transcends even friendship, love, something that's reasonable. But here I was a year after dating my wife-to-be, and we got to the point where the emotions were there, it was reasonable, but I didn't know what it took to truly make that step to married life. And so I got cold feet. And I decided when she was ready to get married that we were done. So I broke up with her, pity her. She has a lot harder life than I do because she's married to me. But this is where I learned again of true love. She didn't give up on me. Oh, she should have walked away because that's what I was trying to do. And she wasn't begging me to come back or anything. She just knew that something was wrong. And she saw me as a brother in Christ. And she began to read the scriptures to me more. And she began to share Christ-like love more. And then it clicked. This agape love that I learned at church from first grade on, this love that I saw in the Christ, I saw in flesh and blood in the woman that I would marry. And I realized how good and great God is. Because that love isn't just on the cross. That love is sent to us in our hearts. And when we're in the scriptures from day to day, we learn of that love more and we apply it more and we see it more in our life. Again, that's the grow root. As great as the gather root is and the group root, the grow root, there's nothing like it. We've had another seven years after learning about agape love and what it really looks like in relationship to others, I learned a little bit more about vocation. So by this time, I'm already a pastor a couple years into ministry. And I'm ashamed to admit it, but after seminary, I thought, I've I've learned enough. I've been to school for nine years after high school to learn more about the Bible. What more could God teach me? Well, I'm ashamed to admit that I didn't know much about Christian vocation, really how it worked. And so in my personal study, I grabbed a paper by a brother in ministry on vocation, which is just simply God's calling to us wherever we're at. And after reading that paper, I was sitting in the kitchen and my wife was making lunch for me and my kids. And it hit me like a ton of bricks. God was in my kitchen. And he was working through my wife to be a blessing to me, to nourish and strengthen my body. And and I saw in every person that was so good to me and so kind to me in that moment, the mask that God was wearing Because it's one thing to know that, yes, every good and perfect gift comes from God, the Father of the heavenly lights, but to see God in action, wearing a mask in human form behind people, which is what Christian vocation is, your calling and my calling to be the hands and feet of God, was brought to tears. And here I am, a pastor, two years in a ministry. How much more could God teach me? Oh, so much more. Daily study. The grow root. Another one. About six, seven years later, it's about 2013 by this time, and I'm sitting in my living room and I'm just 
distraught by all that I'm seeing in our culture, all the different issues, uh, how people are gravitating to one thing or the other, especially on my mind because of some counseling issues in my church, it was LGBTQ issues. And I thought, well, I know the scriptures. I know that this is a sixth commandment issue. So why is it that our culture is struggling like it is? Even more, why is the church being torn apart by homosexuality? And so I ran back to the scriptures and I started studying it more and more. And I recognized it's not just a sixth commandment issue. But these souls behind that issue, they're wrestling with identity. I didn't know that before. I didn't recognize this truth that, again, we are all born by nature without an identity. And so we're reaching, and that's our nature, to reach and embrace true identity. But we look in all the wrong places because of our sinful natures. We don't see by nature that Christ is our identity. And that all these other things that we try to embrace and try to cling to, try to identify with, if it's not Christ, it's just a desperate call to have meaning and worth, to know who we are. And it changed everything. And that's what caused me to say, I should probably write this down. And whether or not anybody would read it, maybe this should be a book. And that's why I wrote Rainbow Savior. It all came out of personal study. Every day, the deep grow root. One more thought, which kind of led me here to St. Peter and the Core 922 Ministries, was just a few years ago before I took the call, and it deals with understanding the family. Everyday conversations that I had with brothers in ministry as we talked about why our young people are leaving the church, and and I thought it was because maybe our youth programming needs more bells and whistles, but I'll be honest with you, at the summer of 2016, I just completed six years as a youth leader in Minnesota, and I was done. I figured I can't reach our youth. And I recognized I was looking to the wrong place to try to connect with our young people. I was trying to do it through the church. And as I was ready to walk away from it, all of a sudden I get this call from St. Peter in the Core in Appleton to be the family pastor there, youth and family. And I thought, God's got a sense of humor because I was done. I was ready to leave youth ministry to somebody else. But because of that call, I was really driven to the scriptures. And again, through personal study and encouragement, I began to recognize all the more. And for some years, I had the suspicion. But families need encouragement. If youth are going to thrive and survive and connect to Christ, it'll be through dads and moms and heads of households. And I recognize that seems to be lacking, definitely in our culture, but maybe even in the visible church. That's the blessing of the grow root. I have a greater appreciation for the institution of family than I've ever had, and it came through personal study and trying times. Now, here's where I'll confess another misstep, a sin of mine. And I'll ask you the same question. As we take a look at our thoughts and our sheet, have you also struggled with the blindness of seeing your need for a deep grow root? I know I have. Again, I can think back to first grade when I thought, I already knew it all. How much more can God teach? I was one of the kids in Sunday school saying, yeah, I heard that story before. What can you teach me now? But God was patient and merciful, and through daily study, boy, he keeps teaching me. And in some ways, I feel like I've only just begun. Can you relate to that? Can you also relate to thinking that you know it all? But in truth, you've been blind to a deeper grow root? Well, tonight's the night when God removes the blinders. That's our prayer. And that's my testimony. But there's others like me, and I know you're like me, and I I wanted to share another testimony from one of the families among us. It's really been working at uh, the grow root every day. It's the Taser family. And so I got a little video clip from Tony Taser. It's two beautiful kids that are there just speaking about how beautiful it is to be in the Word of God every day. Why don't we take a look? Hello, 
2-2 family, my name is uh, Tony Tazier. Uh, this is my son, Anthony Tazier, and my daughter, Ava Tazier. Uh, we have been coming to the Corps for about five years now. Uh, the Grow Root is not only important to me, but it's important as the head of the household to raise my family in the Word of God. When I don't focus on the Grow Root, I tend to slip into temptation and sin more. When I do focus on the grow root, I see more blessings and fruit in my family. A great option that our church offers is the Lead Me Father project that Pastor Monday runs. It's helped me become a better leader in my home. I wanna thank God for the great things he has done for me and the greater things he has in store for our church. So I thank the Tasers for taking the time to just share their experience. Just another testimony, trying to answer the why we can be in God's word every day. But if that's not enough, Pastor Bill or Tony Tasier are telling you, how about we look to someone inspired to encourage us to dig that root deeper into Christ for the Spirit's fruit of, of daily growth in the word. Let's take a look at Psalm chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. I'm going to actually take a look at 2 through 3 here with you. You know, in the opening of that great Old Testament hymnal, the Psalms, the songs of God's people, the very first song talks about being in the Word every day. He starts off by saying, blessed, and that's a fancy Bible word for truly happy, infinitely happy. Blessed is the man whose delight is in the teaching of the Lord. And on his teaching, he meditates day and night. Here's the why. He's like a tree planted beside streams of water, which yields its fruit in season, and its leaves do not wither. Everything, everything he does prospers. That's God's invitation to be in the word. Why? So that you might truly prosper in everything. So that in every season of life, you flourish. And now to share with you experiences I know in common to all of us, Again, let me just show you how God intends for us to prosper in every season by pointing out how being in the Word of God every day, what it does, how it redeems, it saves, everything that's so critical to life. So again, take a look. We got a number of blanks we'll fill in. Let's do the first set. Your true identity, your worth, and meaning. I don't know if you came here tonight struggling with those things. I don't know if you came here tonight struggling with who you are. And because of faults that you have, because of sins of your past, things that you regret that keep you up at night, or because how people treat you, maybe how they, God forbid, abuse you. Maybe you wonder what it's all worth and what am I worth and who am I really? Because this world can be that dark, that tough, even to the point we despair of life. If you can relate to any of that, and who of us can't? And it sounds like you would do well to have a good dose of God's word every day. Not to burden you, but to lift you up. A good dose of like Romans 7, which says, you know, by nature, we are nothing. But you're not just by nature. You're in Christ. You're a new creation. And you read on in Romans 8, how there's no condemnation for you. No matter what people say, no matter how people treat you, no matter how you think about yourself, you are of infinite worth and value. For it was God who covered you with his blood. And he loves you so much that now God says nothing can separate you from his love, that you're more than a conqueror. How good that is to know and hear every time you look into the mirror and you have to face another impossible day. You can see how God's word every day redeems identity, worth, meaning. That's how you prosper. Or what about purpose? Maybe you came here tonight and you're struggling with your purpose. You have so many gifts, but they're not being utilized. You feel like you're in a dead-end job, a dead-end career. You keep getting passed over by a promotion. Or maybe you feel like as a father, you're being held back because of your family and you can't pursue the career you want. Or as a mother, you can't pursue your career goals. Or maybe you got to go back to school and you feel like your life is now on pause or you're in school and you got many years ahead of you and you feel like, again, your life is on pause and you can't wait to finally realize your potential and you wonder what purpose you have now. 
Who of us doesn't feel that way at times? Well, it sounds like then you would do well to hear Peter's words. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, where he calls out to you wherever you're at right now, you are a holy nation, a people belonging to God, a beautiful priesthood that's called in every situation, as mundane as it might be, to declare the praises of him who called us out of darkness into his wonderful light. God has a way of taking the mundane, the futile, the dead ends, and making them sacred, making us like Jesus, who everyone in the world would have thought, there's a dead end as they saw him on the cross. Only in a few days, though, to see a resurrection. That's the daily word. Being in God's word every day. Or how about relationships? Your relationships, who doesn't want Good, healthy, happy relationships, especially with our loved ones. But maybe you came here tonight and there's brokenness in your family. Maybe there's brokenness between your spouse. Maybe there's brokenness between you and your kids or between kids, you and your parents. Maybe there's rebellion with your teenage daughter or son. Children, maybe you feel like your parents are overbearing How good it would be then to be in the word of God as a family every day. Husbands and wives gathering together, fathers and mothers with their children and covering things like 1 Corinthians 13. You know that section that talks about love, how it's agape love and how it's kind and patient and it doesn't envy and it does not keep records of wrong and it isn't easily angered, but it always perseveres, always hopes, it never fails. That'd be good to hear. And to see that love blossom in your family all the more. Or Ephesians 5 and 6, to see what a marriage can look like. Christ in the church, where there's love and forgiveness and reconciliation and redemption. To practice the words of Matthew 18, wherever there's hurt, wherever there's brokenness. For yes, fathers and mothers to be vulnerable with their kids too. Just as we ask our kids to confess, but to confess to them. And to hear words of forgiveness. To hear that as a father and mother, you can begin again. And as a child, that Christ is needed and Christ is here. And that together, we all need Jesus. And as a family, to face the consequences, whatever may come, at peace. That's a good thing. Every day to cover passages like that. Or how about your triumph over the grave? Maybe you came here tonight And you've been rocked to the core. And your faith is shaken because of the news of the death of a loved one or because you're facing your own mortality. Well, now we know why God would say, come to me and be blessed. To hear words like John 11 where Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me will live even though he dies. And to see how Jesus suffered in Psalm 22 or Isaiah 53 or at the end of every gospel and to see how he sprang to life at the end of those very gospels and to know that's your victory. That no matter how much you've been defeated, however hard-pressed you are, when everyone else thinks you're down and out, to know God says, this is a new day. And just as my son has risen from the dead, so too will you rise. To hear that every day, To be reminded of that, that is a good thing. And much fruit comes out of that. So my last question to you, my last question to me, is what's it going to take? What's it going to take to plant a deeper grow root in your life? I know this, more than some bald guy up front clobbering us with the law saying, hey, be in the word. More than even a beautiful family like the Taser family saying, it's working for us. And again, none of us does it perfectly. More than even the inspired psalmist and someone. What's it going to take? It's going to take the one who died for you, who loves you, the word of God incarnate, to invite you in words like Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 through 30, to simply personally invite you to come. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. That's the grow root. For I'm gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. 
For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. What is that yoke he puts on us? What is that burden? It's simply knowing him, connecting with him every day in his word. That's his invitation. And that burden is so much easier than trying to do life away from his word every day. In fact, you know what hell is? Hell is being in a place where there's a famine of his word. Where there's only hardship and burden and there's no comfort. None of the gospel. See what it's like every day to go through this life without the word. It's hell. But with God, in his word, it's heavenly joy no matter the circumstance. So listen to Jesus' call every day. When you feel like you're worthless, hear Jesus say, in my words, your righteousness. And when you feel like your sins cannot be forgiven, hear Jesus say, they are. Hear the word. Again, when you feel defeated, hear Jesus say, because I live, you too will live. And that's all in the word. I mean, what can I compare it to? Jesus' invitation and being in the word every day It's really an awakening. It's like revelation after revelation, epiphany after epiphany. It's like a a guy's eyes that are blind and he can see. It's like being deaf, but finally hearing for the first time. And that's an illustration I want you to walk away with tonight. What's it like to be in God's word and to have the lights go on all the more every day? It's like being deaf and being able to hear. In fact, I'd like to share with you a moment when someone who has been born deaf begins to hear the first time. And I want you to see it as a spiritual metaphor, something to cling to as you contemplate all the more being in the word. Let's take a look. Keep talk going. Oh, do you want me to talk some more? <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> Michael, talk to her. Hello? Danielle, can you hear me? Yes! <laughs> oh, wow. Okay. Is it on? Mm-hmm. Can you hear me? <coughs> Good. How does it sound? It sounds, um, oh my God. Can you hear yourself? Bring it up a little bit more. All right. How does it sound now? Good. Is it sounding better? Can you hear my voice now? <laughs> yeah. What about mom's voice? Can you hear my voice? Yes. Technically, your device is on. Can you tell? Oh, that's exciting. My God, you can't even see them. All I can see are those holes in your hair. <laughs> that's what caused it. <laughs> God. So you it's true. I don't even see them. A difference. A little bit brighter. Oh. oh God. Okay. Oh. okay, it's hug time, Zach. Oh. Here you go. Can you hear my voice? <laughs> oh. oh. That's the experience, isn't it? Being in God's word every day. Oh, the blessings that come when we're in his word. And that's my prayer for us. To be compelled by Jesus' invitation to come to him and have rest. To have our ears open to sounds we've not heard before. To see things that we have not seen before. Well, last thing for you. I don't want to leave you just with the thought, hey, go home and read the word. As a church, we want to help. Because the Bible's big. There's a lot to it, and it is not easy. And sometimes in the thick of things, you can think, what's it worth? So I want to introduce to you, if you don't know about it already, the Lead Me Father Project. That's our church's goal, to not so much to have families come to the church, but for us to go out to your families and try try to encourage fathers and mothers, heads of households, to feel really comfortable in the Word. Like it's second nature, just to talk about the Word, talk about grace, to share the Word in the home. Now, this program really isn't just for fathers or mothers or spiritual heads of families. I'd like to open it up to anyone who would just love to be in the Word every day, but you don't know where to begin, perhaps. And you don't know what resources that you could use that would really help you. You don't know where to start. 
Well, I'd love to meet with you. I'd love to spend just 45 minutes of your time, and I'll honor that. I won't keep you longer. And we put together a plan. And I've got loads of resources, and many of them are free. And I can help you. I'd love to be encouragement to you so that together we can see those fruits come into your life. So if you'd like to take me up on that, I just encourage you to take that communication card Pastor Michael talked about before the sermon and just write your name on it, write your number. Again, if you want to, and I'd love if you would want to, put your email there and on the back of the card, just put big letters LMF. Lead me, Father, which is really a prayer for us to our Heavenly Father. Lead me more into your word every day so that I might truly be blessed and happy. So do that if you'd like. Drop those in the offering boxes and I'll be in touch. God bless us then with a stronger grow root. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, oh, we're so thankful that you've opened our eyes to see how beautiful you are as you come to us in your Son and in the Word. Send us more of your Spirit that we might see things we have not, hear things that we have not, and enjoy life in abundance. Lord, help us to plant deeper grow roots into Christ that we might eat and taste of your goodness, the Spirit's fruit. And finally, Lord, be glorified, which is always the salvation of our souls. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen.